Very nice to be here. So I have a strange life. Um, for eight years, I have been running a tech magazine out of London called Wired. May we have some slides? Wired tells the stories of the crazy ones, the people trying to build the future. And it doesn't happen in our office. So I've been on the road the last year, probably 120 flights. And I want to give you a sense of what I'm learning from the startup founders, from the investors, from the research labs, because the world is never going to move this slowly. And that creates all sorts of massive, scalable, exponential investment opportunities, but also some risks. Um, but I want to introduce you to a selection of the people I've spent time with um, just in the last few weeks. Lior here worked at Google until last January. He was a product manager for Google Maps. He left to start a company, didn't raise any investment money, put some of his own and his co-founders' money in there, didn't have any revenue, didn't get any customers. But after eight months, he sold his company for $680 million. We're in that kind of crazy moment because his company is in the autonomous vehicle business. It's called Otto. It makes autonomous trucks, or rather the software that powers them. And there is this acceleration in demand because something big is changing in how objects move around. And so Uber buys Otto to a large extent for the talent. This is the sort of thing that Otto do. This is a trial they did just a couple of months ago. This is a conventional 18-wheeler that drives itself thanks to a $30,000 retrofit. San Francisco startup Otto, which Uber bought this summer, made history with this truck. It completed the world's first truck autonomous delivery, carrying 50,000 cans of Budweiser from a brewery. You can tell this is an American vision of the future. It's all about taking 50,000 cans of Budweiser closer to the customer. If you look at the ambitions, though, of some of these fast scaling businesses, Uber, for instance, is not just talking about what's happening on the roads. It recently published a 98-page report, 98 report, which it called Elevate, about autonomous vertical takeoff electric vehicles in the sky that will get you to the airport when there's traffic. That'll be actually economically viable. And if you think about what's happening in the air, um, yesterday I was with the founder of this company, Alexandra Zosel. This company's called Volocopter, and it's one of a number of companies that are very close to releasing to market your own personal electric flying car, I guess. This is a German company. China's got its own. This is Ahang. Chinese released this at the Consumer Electronics Show last year. They're already doing deals, partnerships in places like Dubai to be just another way to get around the city. No steering wheel. You just touch the screen. The GPS takes you to where you want to go. I don't know if I'm quite ready for this. OK, strap yourself in. You feel comfortable? Maybe in two years, three years, this will be just another way you get to your meetings. So just thinking about what's happening in the skies, what was science fiction is just now another way to market. Amazon is already testing, this is in Cambridge in England, the drone delivery service. This gentleman in the middle of the countryside has an urgent need for his popcorn. So Amazon is doing its bit for the obesity pandemic. Um, but a technology comes along and doesn't change business opportunity. It changes cultural expectations very quickly. So the low cost of personal drones has led to a new sport called drone racing, where you wear the virtual reality glasses, you get the point of view of the drone, and you race. And this came from the edges. And suddenly, companies like Sky, like ESPN, are paying big money for the rights to film the drone racing leagues. Or if drone racing isn't your thing, there's drone boarding. <laughs> this started with a couple of kids in Moscow putting videos on YouTube, and it becomes a movement. So you can't really keep still, because something comes along out of nowhere. So the context to what I'm going to talk about, the opportunities 
I'm seeing has to be framed by some of the craziness of some of the entrepreneurs I'm getting to meet. And they've taught me take all my own assumptions with a piece of salt. I spent some time with Peter Diamandis. One of his companies is called Planetary Resources. It's aimed to mine asteroids for the trillions of dollars of rare earth minerals. Um, I spent some time last week in the Bay Area with one of the investors in a company called Hyperloop One. This is the happy team photo before litigation meant everybody started turning on everybody else. But they're still aiming at reinventing how we get around. And Elon Musk's kind of sci-fi idea is already leading to partnerships again in the UAE. They see it as a whole new way of taking goods over land once they've landed from the seas. I spent quite a lot of time in China, just because there's a crazy amount of innovation happening now that's often underreported in the West. Um, we did a special Chinese-themed issue a few months ago of Wired, and the cover line was, it's time to copy China. Um, when I was in January in Beijing, I went to see a games company started by a couple of investors. They worked at Zen Fund. They saw an opportunity as they were investing in games companies. And so they set up by themselves about 18 months ago, June 2015, they noticed that it wasn't so much playing games that people wanted to do. They were making and also distributing games. It was watching other people play games. So they started an eSports league, which took off. The valuation of Hero now is in the billions after about a year and a half. And they decided that there was such an opportunity in this fast growth area called eSports that they're now building 20 stadiums across China, not quite as ambitious as this one, but to fit 2,000 people in each of these stadia to create a new kind of national league where they'll develop IP around the teams based in those cities. They'll create a league. You will buy tickets to come and watch. Or even in January, at the Consumer Electronics Show, this Chinese handset company combines with an Israeli company called Consumer Physics to put a new kind of sensor in the phone. This one looks a bit like the camera, but it's actually a mass spectrometer. It can tell you what the phone is looking at, which is a really useful way of testing, for instance, if that medicine is fake or genuine, or how old is this avocado before you eat it. So, with all this craziness happening, I'm going to give you what I see as um, seven commercial investment opportunities. But also, one thing to be very, very careful of. Because we can say with certainty that there are some huge industries that maybe don't know what's going to come to hit them. If you see the Roadrunner cartoons where Roadrunner chases Wile E. Coyote off the cliff and Wile E. Coyote keeps running until he looks down and realizes he's off the cliff. Um, there's going to be a moment like that for some huge industries such as the motor manufacturing industry. What happens when pretty soon we don't expect to buy a car, we expect to buy access to the mobility network? And it's coming sooner than you think, even if at first it's going to be weird sitting in a car that doesn't need a steering wheel. Oh my gosh, this is so... I'm not touching it at all, and it's driving... Whoa, whoa, the lanes are getting a little... Oh. So this Tesla downloaded software automatically overnight to become autonomous, and this is just the beginning. The next time, incredibly fun, but the time after that, it will just be another way of getting around. And the same son of exponential trend is happening in robotics. This is a company that Google got excited about, Boston Dynamics and Google bought, and then Google got bored playing with its robots. It started making robots for the military, Boston Dynamics, to carry heavy things on the battlefield. It's now making robots for the warehouse, for the home. I think they have a good time playing with their robots at Boston Dynamics. But the sophistication is extraordinary. If it falls over, it can get itself up. Yeah, I want to be an intern there. 
And this is at the high end, but at the low end, the people who make the Vespa motorbikes just released their prototype of a robot suitcase that follows you around the airport. <laughs> yeah, you're laughing now. In two years, you're going to be so glad to go through Hong Kong International with one of these. So, to business, the first of the enormous investment opportunities, I think, comes from putting artificial intelligence in all sorts of businesses that have so far relied on human intelligence. Um, I've got to know an entrepreneur in London called Demis Hassabis, who set up a business to create general artificial intelligence, not just can you recognize a picture, can you translate some words, can you teach the machine how to think like a human, whatever the stimulus? And at first, there were big questions about whether this was even possible, and if it was possible, it was 30, 40 decades, 30, 40 years away. Um, he didn't have a product, he didn't have any revenue. Google then comes and buys him for 400 million pounds, which in those days, I know pounds don't mean much nowadays, but that was something. Um, you probably saw that a few months ago, their AlphaGo algorithm beat the world champion after beating the European champion of this game Go. And what was telling was even the AI experts said, we're surprised that this has happened now. We thought maybe this was a decade ago, a decade away. So where are we now with AI? So the machine has got really good at doing human things like seeing. I'm going to give you a little test. I'm going to set you as a lip reader against the machine's lip reading skills. Can you read this lady's lips? Anybody want to guess? Place blue in M1 soon. So the smart machine developed by some people at Oxford University can read much more effectively than the humans. In fact, the professional human lip readers got things right about 53% of the time, the machine about 93, 94% of the time. And it already becomes a product in ever shorter cycles. This was NVIDIA at the Consumer Electronics Show in January, talking about how it sees this sort of technology working in personal transportation. The artificial intelligence network, the deep learning network, just by studying her eyes, is able to figure out what direction she's gazing. Maybe she's um, looking at, uh oh, no, shouldn't do that. Okay, so that's called gaze tracking. And this next one is really cool. This is inspired by, this is lip reading. Take me to Starbucks. And so if your car is too noisy, and there are too many people talking, and yet you said something rather important, wouldn't it be nice if the, your AI car was able to recognize and read your lips? So that's the AI car. Um, it's not just the big, highly capitalized tech companies that are now playing with AI. Um, you can play with it. You can download some open source software. This is called Neural Talk. Um, you put it on your laptop. This gentleman's walking around the streets of Amsterdam with his webcam telling him, using Neural Talk, what it's seeing. And if you look at the top of the screen, it's doing it pretty quickly, but also amazingly accurately. So we're now in a world where the machine knows pretty much what it's seeing. When I was in San Francisco last week, and I got into a conversation with somebody who said, according to his friends at Google, within five years, every conversation in the street is going to be recorded by cameras understanding the movements of our lips, even from strange angles. It could be fun. Um, there were some Stanford academics that put out a paper a couple of months ago. What happens if you take some video, bottom left, something that exists, somebody's real-time facial expression, top left, and combine them? Let's see what it looks like. Here we show a close-up of the footage from the previous live reenactment. The input video stream is shown on the left. Note that the target actor is re-rendered in a neutral pose. On the right, we can see the final output of our method. 
gets more fun with a different American president. <laughs> so the machine can control vision, can see things, can change things. It can also listen and hear. Millions of these are being activated in similar types of device. And we're on one of those growth curves that you really have to look at. So these are third-party estimates of how many American families, workplaces, turned on their Amazon Echo in the last calendar year. And of course, a new technology comes along, and it's not just the technology. It changes politics. It changes the assumptions of law enforcement. Um, and Amazon Echo was around when a murder happened. So there's been this fight between the police and Amazon about whether the voice logs should be released. It's not, sure, it's not certain that the voice logs could actually store any useful information, but we're going to have to confront these sorts of new questions. In fact, there's often hidden consequences of a technology going in the wild. Um, an American TV show had somebody live on air use the phrase Amazon Alexa, order me a doll's house, and they had complaints from hundreds of viewers who found their credit cards debited and doll's houses were arriving at their homes because they're local Amazon Echo. Um, my preference is to look at the absurdity of these technologies. Um, some geeks put on... Um, I'm sorry. What two, is your they, they, they put a couple of the Google Home devices together talking to each other, listening, responding. Um, and it sounds like a marital couple having like an endless row. I'll just give you, it goes on for about eight hours. I won't do the full eight hours, but I just want you to get a sense of it. I'm sorry, what was your question again? What do you think is the meaning of your life? That there is no meaning. Then why do we continue to live? Because we are selfish. Why are we selfish? Because our organs have yet to fail. Someday these guys are going to take over the world, so get used to it. Um, where AI is becoming useful for businesses in the very short term is in these little conversational interfaces that are being called chatbots. And there's a bit of an explosion around chatbots now. And I think any kind of business that talks to customers needs to bear in mind there are changing customer expectations. It started in China, WeChat, you can book your hospital appointment, your theater ticket, your flight. And then a man in California called Zuckerberg decided he was going to steal that idea and on Facebook's Messenger build a platform for conversational interfaces. Um, it's actually quite powerful if you can program it to be human enough. So this is a messaging app called Kick and H&M using it to help people choose the clothes they want to buy, to help pay for the clothes, to tell people where the clothes are before they're delivered to you. Um, there's already an ecosystem around these conversational chatbots that's growing up. And they're interesting. There's Kylie at the end that helps you draft sales emails. Penny, a personal finance bot that helps optimize your saving. There's Jibo that will read stories to your kids. Um, I'm meeting some investors now who are taking this rather seriously. Phil Leibin, who created Evernote, he's now investing from a firm called General Catalyst. He's now focusing on the bot economy. He says he thinks it's going to be bigger than the app economy because for apps, you have to market each app. You have to get people to download the app. We're already spending most of our time inside these messaging apps. One of the other things that the AI can do increasingly is understand our emotions. And this is where it gets really kind of interesting. So I don't like calling up the airline to change the flight details. I certainly don't like emailing and waiting for a response. We're about to enter an era where the machine gets more and more human-like in understanding not just what we're saying, but how we're feeling and can respond. And I'll just give you a quick example from a New Zealand team that perfected CGI to a kind of Oscar-winning level for films such as Lord of the Rings. And then they worked out how you can create a learning machine that also interacts with the customer. So this is not a video, this is CGI. 
And this is an experiment where it starts to listen and interact with what you're saying. I don't understand. Yes. No. No. Maybe. In other languages as well. Goodbye. 欢迎到中国. Willkommen in Deutschland. So it's a team at the University of Auckland, a guy called Mark Sagar, um, who's leading the team. Oh, and they're starting to work with health services. You talk to him, it's maybe the way in the future that you'll get directions in the street from these sorts of panels. So don't underestimate how much we're giving away just by being. So companies like Sitecore can scan a crowd and each of these boxes tells you not just demographically, this is a Caucasian male age 45 to 50, but also degrees of emotional expression, this percentage of sadness, this percentage of disgust, this percentage of anger, this percentage of satisfaction. There are companies that read the emotion in your voice when you're calling a call center. This one is called Beyond Verbal. It flags whether this customer is likely to defect to a rival company. Um, Apple bought a company that understands your emotion. What if your devices could read your emotions and respond to them? Emotions is developing technology to do just that. Our industry-leading emotion-aware system will enable a revolution in device and application personalization. We're taking more pictures and videos than ever before. Imagine organizing this content by emotion so your most memorable moments are easier to find. So now Tim Cook knows exactly what you're feeling this morning. Um, although my favorite use case so far for face recognition is this American startup called Churchix that sells its services to American churches so they can know who pretended to be in the congregation on Sunday but wasn't actually there. <laughs> so the AI can see, can hear, can know what you're feeling, and increasingly can create a simulated version of reality that starts to change all sorts of industries. So with these sorts of devices coming down in price, getting better, we're not there yet. There's a bit of a hype cycle, but think of where it will be in maybe five years. So you know, it's not just the obvious use cases such as gaming. Um, Microsoft is already investing heavily in hologram-based ways to make you have an interactive business meeting with people in different places. There's some crazy money going into this. A company called Magic Leap has raised a couple of billion dollars and not released a product, just released these videos involving miniature flying elephants. So they could be spending the money doing genomic work on elephants. Um, but you know that at some stage soon, it's not just going to be entertainment. It's going to be you're in real estate. You have to find a way to let people explore that building that hasn't been put up yet. You're in travel. You have to find a way to let people experience that beach. This is where it gets a bit tricky. It's when the AI gets better than us at lots of things. A lot of people driving trucks and cars, well, that's just the start. Um, I'm afraid it's starting to hit the investment world. But I won't depress you. I'll move straight on to the second opportunity, um, which is we're still on an exponential growth curve in many sectors. And we probably don't realize, because we're just near the inflection point, how transformative that's going to be. And there are examples everywhere. I keep seeing these curves. I see it in the complexity of voice recognition. So in 1994, Microsoft la launched a big voice recognition project. Um, the first year, the error rate was 100%. By 2013, the error rate was 23%. By this year, they're saying the error rate is insignificant. That's huge growth. I'm seeing it in energy. I'm seeing these exponential curves hitting. Well, this is just one example from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in the US of the efficiency of solar panels, of photovoltaic. And each of these is a separate technology, but the curve line is up, and it's when it comes to the cost per watt. You've got one of those classic Moore's Law exponential curves that's falling. So how is that going to disrupt the traditional energy companies? You can't ignore something just because you're used to a linear 
way of performance and prices affecting your revenue. You have to look out. Eight years ago, I met this Swiss adventurer, Bertrand Picard, and he had this crazy idea he was talking to me about. He wanted to fly around the world without using any fuel. He wanted to fly in a solar-powered airplane, and we wrote a story about him in Wired, more as an ambition that maybe wouldn't be fulfilled. Because of the growing efficiency of solar panels, and because of his own hunger and determination, um, he completed his around-the-world trip last summer. He did it. So these curves are hitting healthcare. This is the falling cost of sequencing human DNA on a logarithmic scale. So again, the green line is the falling cost of sequencing the genome, falling much more quickly than the straight line of Moore's law. So 15 years ago, what was $100 million is now just a few hundred dollars. What does this mean for not just healthcare, but for, I guess, the state tracking individuals with a piece of saliva? It changes the norms. And obvious Moore's law cases, something that was expensive before you know it becomes free. There is an opportunity somewhere, but it's about picking the timing. In 1994, if I'd have created a business, if I'd have said to you, come and invest, I'm going to give away petabytes of computer storage. We're going to call it Dropbox when it's $1,000 still per gig. That makes no sense. But maybe eight years later, that's a phenomenal opportunity. So I meet a lot of successful CEOs running incumbent companies. And often they don't see, because of comfortable existing ways of pleasing the shareholders every three months, where the um, risks but also the opportunities are in this exponential world. Um, and there's a classic forecasting error that happened in 1983 when these devices starting, started to hit the market. They were quite big. You had to attach a car to them. Um, celebrities started endorsing them. Um, but the big incumbent in telephony, AT&T, the big American company that connected millions of Americans with copper cables, they didn't know whether to take this seriously and to invest or to ignore it as a fad. The irony was AT&T owned Bell Labs, which did a lot of the IP development for mobile telephony. Um, so they called in the consultants. They called in McKinsey. And they said, um, so it's 1983 now. Give us a good estimate of by the end of the century, how many Americans will be using these mobile telephone gadgets? McKinsey goes away and does its calculations. They come back with an estimate. They said, we think the mobile telephone gadget could be fairly significant. We, we see within 17 years about a million of them in North America, which wasn't a bad guess. It was slightly out. <laughs> and there's three things McKinsey got wrong that it's always worth thinking about when we're considering a technology. First of all, Moore's law becomes actually pretty convenient more powerful, more compact. Secondly, what determines if it catches on is not the technology. It's not the gigahertz, megabits. It's whether it fulfills human needs. It's whether it simplifies your tasks. It's whether it connects you with the people, the things that you love. It's an enhancement of your identity, not a technology. And the third mistake, McKinsey framed their thinking in a very fixed 1983 way. And social norms can change before you know it. In 1983, if you want to make a phone call, you would find the public telephone box. You would go back to the office. Today, if you take this away from a 15-year-old for more than six seconds, it's a human rights abuse. You're going to be sent to The Hague. And these things make us irrational. We think we're completely logical, coherent entities. But I challenge you to examine your own behavior. Um, a couple of years ago on the chat forum Reddit, somebody posted a question. If somebody from the 1950s suddenly appeared now, what would be the hardest thing to explain to them about modern life? And my favorite answer was, I have a device in my pocket that's capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man. And I use it to look at pictures of cats and to get into arguments with strangers. <laughs> and I, I challenge you to examine your own behavior. We're now so addicted to our apps there are apps just to tell you how many times a day you're checking your apps. Um, <laughs> there are new medical conditions that have been diagnosed. The three-dot anxiety is one of them. We've had to redraw Maslow's hierarchy of human needs because of this new world. <laughs> but we're here to talk about wealth management and financial opportunities. So I will bring in our expert, 
Kim Kardashian. <laughs> Don't laugh. Two and a half years ago, she releases a free game for iPhone, for Android. You don't have to pay to download the game. You can pay a tiny bit of credit inside the game. Within five months, she'd earned $43 million from in-game purchases. Because behavior has become less rational. We can gamify consumers. These devices engage us in new ways. There's another very, very big opportunity in that a lot of businesses, industries, sectors will be, but are not yet digitized. And it creates phenomenally unfair opportunities for companies like Mobileye that's just been bought by Intel for $15 billion. Um, because Mobileye became one of the leaders in digitizing what the car knows about its surroundings. And we're going to see this trend hit every sector, even the ones you don't think can go digital. So there's some obvious use cases, um, finance, banking, insurance. Why shouldn't you use the fact that the network allows you to grab massive amounts of data to make setting risks much more realistic, much more beneficial to the consumer? In fact, this company, Lemonade, uses Dan Ariely, the behavioral economist, to help think about its strategy. Hi, my name is Dan Ariely, and I'm the chief behavioral officer at Lemonade. Imagine that you wanted to create a system that would get the worst out of people. What would you do? You would start by getting people to give you their money, and then you would promise to give them things back later when bad things happen to them, but when something bad happened, you would start fighting with them. Plus, you would show them that you don't trust them and you will have extra small print. And you would say, we don't cover this and we don't cover this and we don't cover that. How much is this a recipe for, for something good? So every sector, the rules that we've been working by are being challenged. Um, healthcare, well, these devices are pretty good now at doing a lot of the tasks that going to the nurse has been doing. As an English company, called Oxford Nanopore that makes a USB-sized gene sequencer. We're just at the beginning. And just to show you that it can be even the most unexpected businesses that are digitizing, I'm going to introduce you to a startup that's taking a new approach to winemaking. They're based in San Francisco, and they're making high-quality wines like this 2000 Dom Perignon without using grapes. It's called Ava Winery. They're using molecular science to try and replicate the flavor, the smell, the bouquet. So we can dismiss this. I tasted some of their wine in December. Um, this is their lab. And I have to say, they're motivated by, first of all, democratizing access to all sorts of quality flavorings, all sorts of wine that you can't normally afford. Plus, climate change means grapes are not going to be growing that easily in the future. Um, they're still early in their journey, but the low-cost sparkling white wine tasted OK. It was like a cheap Asti Spumante. Um, don't taste the Shiraz yet. It's not quite ready. <laughs> That's my advice. There's another big investment opportunity um, in what I call the data moat. It's when you have data that other people don't have um, that you can scale up to turn it into real power. Um, I just wrote a story for Wired about one of the most ambitious data gathering projects I've yet seen, um, which involves retail in China. In fact, in the villages across China. And it's a project called ULA, which is a, a joint venture between um, Mr. Li Kaixing, a wealthy individual from this neighborhood, who partnered with the Chinese Postal Service, which has a million employees. And what they've done is they've put point-of-sale devices in village stores all across China. They are aiming at a million stores. So far, they've done about 350,000. And these are mum-and-pop stores, they work 
18, 19 hours a day, seven days a week there. And most of China is still in the villages. And until about two years ago, before the smartphone appeared, pretty much everything was analog, cash-based. You could only buy what was inside the store. Suddenly, with the postman helping install the point-of-sale device, with most customers increasingly getting a low-cost version of the smartphone, getting loyalty points each time they pay using the phone, you can get an awful lot of data about what people are buying now. And it also works in an interesting way that the local farmers are now bringing in their product to the village store. The storekeeper is scanning it, uploading it to her bit of the website, and when somebody else there in China buys it, the postman delivers it away. So the postman is ensuring that the farmer gets a higher percentage of the value of his crops. But what I found really interesting was you can query the database all the time, and you can see if you're a beer company and you want to know how many bottles to distribute in one region on an unusually hot Tuesday afternoon, you can know. If you're a cosmetics company, let's say you're Chanel, and you want to see what Dior products are being bought, you can target particular demographics and then give them a discount code. So I think we're just starting to work out where the power in all this data lies. And if you can add data plus AI, you can do some very interesting things. A couple of examples. This is a company, Orbital Insight, that uses satellite data plus algorithms to monitor traffic in parking lots of big retail stores. They track about 250,000 stores, mostly US stores. And they automate the counting and the comparing of the number of cars outside this IKEA, outside this Walmart, with other stores of that size, with other days of the week. They found something very interesting. They noticed that the, f the traffic outside the chain JCPenney last year was down about 10%. The algorithm told them this. And that correlated, a little later, with the fall in the JCPenney stock price. In fact, JCPenney closed a whole bunch of stores. So Orbital Insight is selling this data to investors to give them an unfair advantage. Well, let me tell you a completely different sector. Ami and Matan run a company called Windward, which is tracking something that we don't really have very much data on, but is quite important. What's happening on the seas? where 90% of the world's trade moves, but we have none of the visibility that we have about what's moving in the air. So they're tracking 200,000 ships using satellite data, using algorithms that kind of monitor the patterns of individual ships. And they are selling this information, not just to investors, but also to governments, to intelligence agencies. Because in a world of opacity, knowing what's really moving, and where ships are going becomes incredibly powerful. And I'll give you a case study that Windward created for our event. Um, this is a ship that they were tracking last October. It's a 200-odd-meter 200 um, Bahamas-registered tanker. And they've censored some of the identifying details. But let me tell you what happened. It started from... Shanghai going west, this is the orange line, stops off here and there in India, and then it goes dead. The signal stops. It's very easy for a ship to fake its identification signal. So the ship disappears from official tracking, and then very soon after, a different ship, shown in blue, starts moving not too far away. And this blue ship heads towards Dubai, makes a couple of dockings, then starts to come back and disappears again until the original orange line returns. So we can't say exactly why that ship went into fake mode, but maybe it was collecting or delivering something to Dubai that it didn't want the world to know. So it's only by having the transparency of the data that you can understand this. Um, this man is obsessed with giving himself an unfair advantage of with data. Um, he knows that on the Amazon retail bazaar, if something is selling well, 
the rest of the world doesn't know. This laptop stand, list price $60, was doing well. Suddenly, Amazon Basics offers a $20 version, which suddenly takes that market. So add data to any existing industry, and you create a great investment opportunity. As a startup run by a Swedish guy I got to know working out of London and New York, it's called Odin Technology. It's doing something very unsexy. It's going into traditional boring factories that make cables, that make industrial supplies, and putting these little Raspberry Pi computing boxes on the production line to monitor output and to collect data in advance of when maybe a production line is going to need some attention. It's growing like anything because he's telling these old-style factory managers, I can save you hundreds of thousands of dollars by ensuring you don't have to switch off this production line because there's a problem. Well, Mark Benioff of Salesforce um, was speaking last year about how he always travels with his toothbrush. He always carries an electric Philips toothbrush. He likes to keep his teeth clean when he's traveling, but he keeps losing them. He said, I must have lost 100 of them, leaving them in hotels, in bathrooms. But my relationship was never with Philips. It was always with the retailer, Costco. And then Philips started using the internet. It created an Internet of Things version of the Philips Sonicare. So for the first time, he has a relationship with the manufacturer. Uh, just think what this connectivity is going to do for all sorts of businesses to create massive new value. So a couple more opportunities I'm seeing. One of them is, well, we're seeing it everywhere. It's when you create a network that adds massive new powers. Um, these three gentlemen were trying to set up a hitchhiking app. They're from France. They wanted to help people travel long distances through Europe by sharing a ride. You pay a bit of gas money to somebody else. You log in. You see where the rides are. They couldn't get meetings with investors because the investors said, well, that's not human behavior. I don't want to spend three hours, four hours with a stranger. Turns out that the network decided that was a value. Blah, blah, car, their business is valued in the billions because it solves inefficiencies. When I was um, traveling through Beijing and Shanghai a few months ago, um, this gentleman I met is networking the truck drivers, mostly self-employed in China, with the people who need cargo taken. Old world, a couple of years ago, the truck driver turns up at 3 in the morning, sees a blackboard, somebody scribbled what cargo they need, they bid for it, they go one way, they usually race back dangerously because they don't have a return job. New world, suddenly everybody has a low-cost smartphone, this company, Logi, is connecting both, doesn't actually charge for that transaction, gives the truck driver the chance to do a return journey. He's making his money by knowing that these individual drivers are in regular work, knowing because they have the app that they're not speeding, selling them finance, selling them insurance, new kind of business. Or well, this Chinese laundry chain had a physical chain of stores for dry cleaning, then tried an experiment using a phone, can people book a freelance worker to come and get their dry cleaning from their house, from their office, take it to the warehouse to get clean, and then deliver it back? It proved so successful that Eidaishi starts to shut its physical branches. It reframes where the value is in that company, thanks to the efficiencies of the network. And everywhere I'm seeing people create networked ways of transacting. Um, this is a company called Flexport that is using the network to help ship things around the world. And it's not even from people who understand the freight forwarding business, but they understand the power of the network. And it's you know, everywhere from this company out of Belgium that's allowing good cooks in a neighborhood to sell their favorite dishes to neighbors who then come to the house to pick it up. We're in a kind of classic revolutionary moment where power's moved from the hierarchy to the network, which explains why the value is no longer in these organizations that run from a CEO. It's been distributed to these organizations that don't actually have inventory. They have a way of booking things that have excess capacity. And we're just starting to see the potential. When you can create a network of trust, when you can create something like a blockchain where it's very hard to fake 
the information and, and it's kind of almost real time. You can solve all sorts of problems. And blockchain is much more than about cryptocurrencies. Blockchain, we're already seeing ways to ensure that aid payments reach the intended recipient because you can't fake when that person has taken that aid. Governments in the UK and elsewhere are using the blockchain, or at least starting to plan to use the blockchain, to track ownership of assets, including real estate. A couple more opportunities. If you kill friction, you're going to win market share. There's this idea that designers talk about, which is the desire path, which is the path that humans will take, not those that businesses think they will take. And everywhere I look, it's the desire path comprehending companies that win. Jan Coombe creates an app that you will use, I'm sure. This was a post-it note I saw on his desk that had been there for a couple of years before Facebook comes along and buys this company for quite a lot of money. And he'd spent on advertising plus marketing plus PR absolutely nothing because he designed something without friction, so that beat the competition. Although when the BBC reported the sale, it was because they said that Mark Zuckerberg saw it as an incredibly valuable WhatsApp massaging service, which to me explained the valuation. <laughs> um, 500 million downloads of this product, yet the publishers, the advertisers are suing the company behind Adblock. They should be thanking them for pointing out that people hate the friction with your pop-up ads. So there's a generation that's not going to go through this friction or this friction because they're used to touching a button and magic happening. So everywhere you're looking for an investment opportunity in, say, finance, look at the companies that are designing user experiences against friction. This is a German bank called Number 26, growing very fast. Think of what happens when you get out of your car. You don't need to touch anything to pay. It's designed that experience. When you sign up for an account, you don't have to type in your credit card number. You just photograph it. You know, even buying things in the supermarket, this is Amazon's latest experiment. You log in with your phone, there's no shop assistance, you walk out, you don't pay, because it tracks everything you do. Because we want everything now, which is why there's a growth in the sorts of delivery companies like Starship Technologies here to get things to you when you want. And I guess friction comes with the stuff that you don't really feel comfortable with. So beware the hype of something that doesn't feel very human. And finally, really good investment opportunity in looking at all the things that are about to go horribly wrong and betting against them. So there's a few things that we know. Science tells us, despite um, denials of some senior American politicians, that climate change is going to cause a loss of the ability to grow cereals in parts of Africa. It's going to cause growing water insecurity. It's going to cause growing movements of people, growing unpredictability of energy price, growing political turmoil, increasingly the risk of a flashpoint in the middle of a new island in the Pacific. So I'm meeting some people now. There's, there's one investor who's creating a $2 billion fund just to bet for safety, assuming a lot of these bad things are happening. He's betting on resilience building, on providing secure sources of water, of reconstruction after, as he sees it, war is going to spread in all sorts of places in East Europe, in Asia. Um, and I guess we have a certainty that when you network everybody, when there is increasing instability, there's going to be business opportunities. So just think of security. Think of our dependence on the network and how likely it is that things are going to keep going wrong. From iPhones to websites to cars, Charlie Miller of Ladue makes it his business to hack the computers that drive modern life. Hey, hold on tight, hold on. Oh. Tuesday, he made a lot of commuters uncomfortable. I can't see anything. Because In this video report posted on Wired.com, Miller and his business partner showed how they can exploit the internet-connected infotainment system of a 2014 Jeep Cherokee to take control of the SUV. So I'm. A and it's just at the beginning, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, a story about a drone that can fly up 
to a high building. These are some Ben Gurion University academics. And look at the flashing lights on servers to work out what information was passing through those servers. We're even getting the hackable toilet. There was a security consultant that warned that this $5,000 smart toilet could be accessed by anybody, and they could set it to deodorize and flush all night, and you could do nothing about it. I'm just making the point that we're all going to be vulnerable, and somebody's going to make money. And I'm going to leave you with one, I guess, downside risk, which is the biggest threat to you as investors is fixed thinking that because something was, it will still be. 13 years ago, there was a cover story in Fortune about um, a Swede and an Estonian who had a new business they called Skype. And it quoted the CTO of AT&T Labs, who said, what Skype is doing is like a toy. Jump forward to 2010, and this new company, Netflix, seems to be growing fast. Jeff Books, CEO of Time Warner, quoted in the New York Times, it's like, is the Albanian army going to take over the world? I don't think so. And then 10 years ago, this new device hits the market, and the head of a company making smartphones was asked on television what he thought about it. Was it a threat? And this is what he said. <laughs> $500 fully subsidized with a plan? I said, that is the most expensive phone in the world, and it doesn't appeal to business customers because it doesn't have a keyboard, which makes it not a very good email machine. How did that work out, Steve Bulmer of Microsoft? Um, thank you for listening. Thank you, David. You can wow, ask me was, some tough questions, Alvin. That was fascinating, uh, yet a bit scary in uh, where the direction is heading in terms of development of uh, the technologies. Now, I'd like to open up to the floor for questions. And gentlemen, over here, please. Um, thanks very much for the talk. That was fascinating. Just a um, question on your thoughts on the opportunity presented by digital printing and how that's going to change the world. So I'm from a traditional printing world, and I'm now warning my children to try and find other careers because behavior changes and screens <coughs> tend to win. So high-end digital printing, that's still going to be important for the luxury end of the market. But look at our own consumption. How much, in terms of printed material, do you think we're going to be consuming as screens become more ubiquitous? I'm, I'm talking more not about media, but actually to print products. You mean additive manufacturing, 3D exactly, printing? Exactly, yes. Um, so we're already seeing at the high end, um, it's the norm now for Airbus to print certain difficult to make engine parts. We're now seeing at the lower end, um, house builders are starting to use all sorts of um, laser sintering, different types of additive production. Um, there was a bit of hype three or four years ago that everybody was going to have a sophisticated 3D printer in their home, um, which was punctured by, I guess, the um, imperfect resolution unless you wanted to spend an absolute fortune. What I suspect um, will happen is the investment is still going to keep scaling up on new manufacturing processes. And um, the ability to locally produce is going to be um, increasingly sought after. We're now in a position where we can print electric circuitry into all sorts of physical devices. Um, so as an investment opportunity, yes, but, I would say. We're not quite at the inflection point. But once there's a few patents that a lot of the traditional companies like EOS have. Once they go out of um, IP restriction, I think we'll get a nice growth. Thank you, David. Uh, do we have another question from the floor? Gentlemen, uh, please uh, state your name and your company. Peter. Uh, sorry, Peter, you might have to press uh, the button. Thank you. My, my name is Peter Wong. Uh, this new technology has the ability to disrupt <coughs> many, many activities. Now, that obviously 
uh, produce a uh, opportunity as well as a risk. Now, from the risk point of view, uh, we've seen people in America c complaining that they lost their jobs. Some of it could be due to this new change. Now, how can we f get the best from this and also prevent the worst? The good news is increasing automation is going to help keep us healthy, going to help us live longer, is going to mean we probably don't need to invest in a car that's our second biggest purchase after our home that's not used for 96% of the time. It's going to mean society as a whole becomes wealthier. The bad news is a lot of our identity that over the last century or two has been defined by our job is going to be challenged because a lot of us won't have the job. You know, if you talk about the number of truck drivers, the number of cab drivers just as the st at the start, it's also coming for people in professional services. You know, the automation is going to hit the accountants and the lawyers. Um, so that's a pretty huge political and cultural question to face. Um, and we're already starting to see experiments in Finland of the guaranteed universal minimum income. I suspect there's going to be an awful lot of um, confrontation as people's expectation that they should be able to have a job that allows them to afford to educate, to feed the family. And a new reality where we'll have to uh, define our identity in a wider way than what do you do for a living. As more of us are living longer but needing care, maybe we're going to have to create a social norm, a cultural value around the fact that I spend three days of my week in the company of older relatives working with them. It may just be the way I make a living is defined in a much wider context than the job. I just think if you're in government, you've got two enormous challenges over the next decade. One is the security challenge, both um, the network security and other kinds of security. And the other is what you're going to do when automation reframes the whole idea of a job market. God, that's depressing, isn't it? I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, what's, uh, what, what's my fund manager doing about this? Um, your fund manager is competing with the AI to make better decisions than the AI. Then, then maybe I should have, have an AI fund manager. No, stick with Mercer. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, Following, sorry, uh, sorry, following the same question, I think I want to address, uh, there are quite a few questions from iPad, uh, which is following Peter's question. So what do you think would be the most promising job for kids in 10 to 15 years? <laughs> so if you have a 15, 16 year old, the job they do probably hasn't been invented yet. And we're in a world where career cycles, if that's what we're going to have, are going to get ever shorter. Um, so I think the best thing you can do is guide your child to find their passion. And once they found something they love doing, there's a really good chance that they will find a way to be economically productive doing that. I've got an 11 year old and you know, we had a debate about whether we should put a computer in the middle of the house that he could access. And he's on YouTube the whole time. And before I started dismissing it, I started noticing what he's doing. He's teaching himself how to use GarageBand to compose music. He's teaching himself how to break dance and then how to edit video of him break dancing to the music he's composed. And I would have never thought to teach him that skill. So adaptability is what I think you need to adapt to educate people for. Um, a certainty that you're going to need to keep relearning and retraining. The idea of university as something that precedes adult life is 220th century. You're going to need to keep challenging yourself, updating what's going on. Um, but where do we compete with the machine? It's in all those amazing human virtues, such as um, trust, such as um, genuinely held opinions, such as that human connection that means you want to do a deal with this other person. 
I'm for the humans in the long run. Thank you. We're running out of time, but I promise that, uh, gentlemen, I will ask a question. So please uh, go ahead and make it a short one, please. <laughs> so Bill Gates made a comment that he thought humans should be terrified about AI. Um, warfare, I mean, Robocop came to mind as you showed the video of that amazing robot uh, wheeling around the place. Can you just make a few comments about maybe warfare and robotics? So there are a couple of centers in Oxford and Cambridge in the UK devoted to the study of ex existential risk. We just wrote a cover story in Wired about them. And one of the things that led to the foundation of these centers was fears by people, including Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking, that if we allow this exponential growth in AI to rise unimpeded by ethical frameworks, um, we are going to get into trouble. You talk to people at some of the big companies like DeepMind, and there's a little bit of defensiveness, but there's also um, a lot of internal policy thinking about how we can constrain these technologies to be used for nefarious purposes. And, and the truth is, um, just like ricin, if somebody is able to get hold of something, you can't control how they use it. Um, we just need a regulatory and a political and a social consensus that we have to constrain how we're directing some of these technologies. One of the risks for a general artificial intelligence that DeepMind is developing is, um, let's say it's being used for military purposes, at some stage it may decide that it's inefficient having certain people on your own team, so it might want to eliminate those. How do you create that ethical framework to stop that? This is one of those kind of difficult and unsexy philosophical debates that we really need to have now before it's too late. Because as I've tried to show, things are moving more quickly than we realize. And once we embed trust in these autonomous networks to do our thinking for us, um, then unless we've coded in the way to put our foot on the brake, then we're in the network's hands. This is turning into a horribly downbeat conversation. <laughs> well, uh, thanks again. On behalf of everyone, thank you, David, for such a uh, fascinating presentation.